Hello, everyone, and especially um, hello, Nicolas. It's great to have you. Hey. So uh, today we are going to do an interview about uh, Nicolas' research. Let me first uh, introduce um, us, and in particular, Nicolas. So my name is Axel Haus. I work in the research department for Selective. And Nicolas Ravana, who is um, the main guest today, of course, is the founder and CEO of Factor Research. And he runs um, quite, a quite interesting website and the company Factor Research. So the research is centered around factors, but also the entire investment world. And it's particularly interesting what you did in your piece, um, ESG data, dazed and confused. So we will talk about ESG today. And um, in particular, this topic is, in my view, not a trend, but a, a necessity nowadays, right? So to give an example, at Selective, if we talk to clients these days, most of the conversations are either centered around ESG or touch upon ESG in these days, right? So this is despite the market is still very young. So there's um, not yet well-established standards, and this is what we talk about today. So there's also um, some, some, some reasons for confusion in all this data. So Nicholas, please tell us, based on this research that I just mentioned, which is also published um, on ETF streams beyond Beta magazine, what is the most important finding? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Now, with regards to uh, that research piece, um, I think the most important finding was how different ESG data sets can be. And the reason why I'm saying that is because we analyzed a number of ESG data sets historically from different providers. And when it came across that data set, and also I cannot disclose who it's from, it's from a, one of the large uh, ESG data providers, it's a name that everyone knows. We were simply surprised by how different um, ESG stocks that rank high and low were to other data sets. Um, simply because if you look at a large number of ESG data sets from different providers, um, sometimes you do see common threads among them, um, and this data set was completely different. And um, even today, after having spent quite a bit of time on it, we are still, like the title says, dazed and confused. Is, is there an incentive for ESG data providers to differentiate? Um, I think so. Um, clearly, yes, simply because um, if you don't differentiate, then effectively what you're offering is commodity. So let's say all the ESG data providers would be using the same frameworks to rank stocks on ESG. And then effectively, everyone has the same framework. That effectively would mean that everyone would compete on price. And ESG data providers, of course, don't have an incentive to do so. Um, so that's why differentiation is helpful in terms of being able to show clients that your framework is better from that perspective and another data provider can show, well, we have a different philosophy here and different rankings of data sets. And therefore, we believe our uh, framework is superior to yours. Having said that, I don't think that's a deliberate decision, at least initially, of the ESG data providers to provide such different, uh, differentiated perspectives. I think it's more of a function that you know, like 10, 20 years ago, when ESG data providers started offering data, that they had to come up uh, from scratch. There wasn't a framework, there are no standards, and effectively everyone had to formulate what it means for a company to rank high or low on certain metrics. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And in this context, let me let me quote from your research. You write, investors need to be cautious in evaluating ESG data, which has become increasingly complex given the abundance of options. Right. So there are many possibilities. Um, the, 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 the choice of a data provider and how you incorporate into a, a strategy, right? And as I understand this sentence and your, your research, so this is also where the confusion comes from, right? And to give you a bit of the background, at Selective, we try to work with different data providers. So we have an open architecture there. And we also try to advise our clients in what the best solution for a given use case might be, right? But still, and there is uh, this. There remains this this challenge um, of heterogeneity in, in ESG data, which could be good for some reasons, but it also leads to intransparency. So the the question that I have for you is: Does the abundance of options lead 
to a lack of transparency? Um, I would change your question to, does it lead to uh, mistrust? And uh, certainly from my own perspective, um, it's difficult if you look at ESG products, um, which are based on different ESG data providers, to get the sense that they're all the same and they kind of get you what you want. So I think the most well-known example, simply to highlight the complexity of different data providers, is Tesla, the car maker, because on um, from on the score of some providers, it effectively looks like Tesla looks very high uh, from the ESG score because they produce electric cars, they're good for the environment, and so on. Um, on other providers, it looks very low because they produce or they incorporate batteries um, into the electric cars, which need cobalt, and cobalt is mainly mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where child labor, especially mining, is an issue. So you have this one company where it looks good on, from one perspective and bad on the other. So who do you believe? And same thing is if you look at enough um, ESG products, you often find surprising constituents. So in the sense of, for example, intuitively, you might think that the energy sector is not good from an environmental perspective, so should rank low on E. Having said that, um, there's, of course, also the topic of tracking error. And if you simply build ESG scores from an absolute perspective, which would basically mean that you get rid of complete energy and sectors you know, that have very high industrial bases, you would introduce very large uh, biases um, and large tracking errors. And also investors do like ESG, they don't like tracking errors, um, especially when they're negative. So that leads to a lot of complexity um, and also a little bit of mistrust from our perspective in a sense that you do want to invest um, in a portfolio where you think that corporates are doing good. They're good for the local communities, good for schools, good for employees, have good governance, good for the environment. Um, but if you look at enough ESG products and data providers, you just see how humongous the exercise is of evaluating them. And that it also leads to a little bit of distrust if someone is pushing an ESG portfolio in your direction, um, just because you've seen that it's not always in there. What do you expect to be in there? Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's very interesting, especially the cases that you mentioned about individual stocks being ranked differently um, across different providers, right? So, so, so what I think directly is that it needs a high level of expertise, right, to to incorporate ESG strategies. And and if you just say, okay, let's let's buy in some data and use it, then you sometimes you don't really understand what you're doing. So you need this knowledge um, on the, on the buy side as well, right? Uh, yeah, correct. But just think about how complicated it is, right? So let's say you just look at one ESG data set. So effectively, what you want to do is let's just take the current stock universe, for example, Eurostox 50. So that's fairly simple, right? You rank all the stocks, you take that ESG data set, and you figure out what stocks rank high and what stocks rank low. And you kind of get a feel in terms of how that portfolio looks. But if you want to do this properly, you also want all the historic ESG ratings from the data provider. Now, and then kind of like back testing in terms of like what have been the implications for return and for risk and biases from a sector perspective or from a factor perspective, uh, it's quite complicated. Um, you effectively need a quant analyst, a quant team for that, right? Um, you need the data itself, which is expensive. Um, and then think about replicating that exercise across all those different ESG data providers. So indeed, you do need not probably only one expert, you need multiple experts or in-house teams. And that's, of course, one of the major challenges for lots of institutional investors that perhaps do not have that expertise in a sense of where do they get it from? And then again, even there is the question of trust, right? In a sense of like, who do you believe? Um, because often these topics, even if you look at them in depth, for example, looking at the frameworks, the white papers that the ESG data providers show in terms of the methodology, um, it's very complex and it takes often quite long to really understand how do stocks get arranged. Um, and the complexity comes partially from more data becoming more available over time and the framework yes. changing. So it's not a static exercise, right? Um, it's a very dynamic one. Um, and that's, of course, what everyone has to deal with, the ESG data providers, the um, asset management companies, and also the ultimate investors in terms of trying to understand that. Um, but it's not uh, easy. Yeah. No, I understand that. And the, the data availability over time, or let's say historically, is something that you touch upon in your research as well. Uh, so in, in your sample um, data set, the ESG ratings 
have improved over time, right? Which I, at first sight, would say, what, that's, that's great, right? So companies rank higher today compared to the past. Uh, however, you have a different interpretation there as well. So what's your interpretation? Yeah, exactly. We also thought uh, this is great news, you know, like there's more good corporates, right? Uh, they're finally doing the right things and everyone's improving. Uh, but unfortunately, we started digging um, and talking to the data provider, trying to find out why certain companies or even the average moved up uh, that dramatically. And for example, we looked at Microsoft initially. So Microsoft had a ranking of, I think, 90 today. So the score from that data provider goes from zero to 100. And it had, I think, 50 a few years ago. And so we were kind of wondering, so Microsoft, you know, the, you kind of know the core products. Uh, they haven't changed dramatically. What improved so dramatically with Microsoft? And so we started talking to the data provider. And, and effectively, they outline that simply more data has become available. And so as more data becomes available in terms of, for example, carbon emissions, so that means the companies disclose more data in their annual reports and during conferences and presentations, that effectively that ESG data provider can provide a higher score because they have more data to evaluate. Now, the problem with this methodology is that this was done with a hindsight bias. So effectively, that data provider defined a framework in beginning of 2020 and looked backwards. And of course, in 2005, Microsoft published a lot less points uh, with regards to ESG to be evaluated. Um, and from the, the perspective of 2020, that kind of makes sense. The problem, of course, is if you were investing in Microsoft in 2020, in 2005, so back in that uh, point in time, um, that score would have looked very different simply because it was a different methodology. So effectively, the underlying issue is that the data provider has changed his methodology from a hindsight perspective. And the same thing could happen again because companies will continue to provide more data. So the question is, can you believe the ESG scores today for Microsoft, for example, right? That 90, um, will that 90 still be 90 in five years time? Or would it have been changed in hindsight again? And yeah. that, you know, that explains a little bit why those ratings have increased on average because more data has become available. But it also shows, again, the complexity um, of data providers to deal with that. And you as an investor trying to make the call in terms of, okay, you know, like, how do I think about this now, right? Do I feel comfortable with the ratings as of today? Or would I be concerned that you know, they might change quite dramatically um, in a few years when there's a different framework that perhaps incorporates even more metrics from the Eastern yeah. world? I mean, for researchers, it's definitely a problem, but in general, it's it's very good to have more data available, right? So that's also a positive development there. Uh, true, in general, we're all for more data, right? Um, yeah. But it's also more challenges, as you say. Yes. Let me let me let me um, quickly refer to a study from the European Commission. The study is called "Study on Sustainability-Related Ratings, Data, and Research," and the authors show that the correlations of ESG ratings between major ESG data providers are surprisingly low. So for some um, sub sub um, E sub S sub G data sets, they are even below 0.5. So you have this exactly this heterogeneity that you just talked about, right? So, uh, but still, as a researcher, I'm interested in making general conclusions. Um, and general predictions about the properties of ESG data sets. So can you help here? How would we do that? Do we need to combine a lot of data sets or what do we do there? Uh, it's, there's no easy answer there. So I think the only commonality across the stocks was the one I mentioned in terms of like in general companies that rank high in ESG being larger companies, uh, so because of more resources. Um, I think if you look at all the data sets we looked at, um, there are some biases um, that you see, uh, for example, the negative bias towards value and size, uh, positive bias towards, from a factor perspective, to uh, low volatility and quality. Um, and you can also look at that from a sector perspective, in a sense that um, on the companies that rank high on ESG, often tends to be companies that um, have like are more from the technology sector versus um, companies that rank low on ESG and more from the energy sector. Having said that, uh, this was a lot clearer a few years ago. I think the correlations have probably decreased now because now often the data is sector neutral. So that even within energy, 
you can have companies who rank high and low. And that goes back to trying to minimize the tracking error there. So um, overall, you know, these data sets are heterogeneous. I don't think there is an easy solution. I think there's some common threads. Um, but given that the way to calculate them has, I think, even more diverged than a few years ago and probably will continue to diverge um, because as a data provider, you want to differentiate yourself further. You want to take new sources that no one else has, right, in order to provide more value. I don't think that they will become more homogeneous over time. So effectively, what you would need is that outside expertise that either helps you to understand those different frameworks. And I think um, that is improving over time. For example, investment consultants that advise pension funds because they are more familiarizing themselves with the different frameworks so that um, over time, you know, at least with the help of an outside expert or a company like Selective that allows you to slice and dice ESG data providers, but at least that the different frameworks are clearer and more easy to adjust in the sense of what are the differences and then leave it up to the investor in the sense of what does he feel most comfortable with from a philosophical perspective, either in terms of deciding on one framework, one provider, or perhaps combining several. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That Okay, so so that that view is 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 quite striking. So you're saying that you don't expect the industry itself becoming more homogeneous, right? So oh. so so you expect the data providers to collect exclusive data in order to have also a competitive edge, right? So we're looking completely at the at the private company side of things. Uh, I mean, of course. When there's a lack of transparency in investing, you directly think of regulators, right? Well, how, how do you perceive the policy um, policy view here? So, uh, what what are policymakers going to do with this intransparency? What's your view there? Um, I think this question comes often up in terms of should the regulators help to harmonize data sets? And I think that uh, would be a total wrong approach, um, simply because if you look at a government regulation or intervention with regards to financial markets in general, there's a few success stories, but there's also a lot of hit and misses. So as an example, you could look at the key information document, the KID, which each mutual fund in Europe needs to publish. It's required by regulation and it's almost a worthless document. No one reads that. So having the government decide in terms of how to calculate ESG scores, I think is the wrong approach. Uh, simply because why does the government know better than the industry? They don't. Uh, having said that, I think there is the need for not necessarily regulation, but more in the sense of perhaps a push from um, the government in a sense of forcing companies or uh, nudging them to disclose more data that is within the public interest. So, for example, carbon emissions. And either you can simply force companies uh, to disclose that, or you can do something like a comply and explain policy, which has been implemented before with companies that effectively, you know, like if they don't want to disclose, for example, carbon emissions, that they have to explain why not. Um, and that, you know, kind of incentivizes companies to do so and provide more data. And that I think will be beneficial for data providers. But in terms of how they actually calculate ESG scores, I think that should always be left up to the providers. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for, for this for this interview. Nicholas Rabin is the CEO and founder of Factor Research. I recommend to everyone to, to look at the website. Um, I do it frequently. It's very interesting. The pieces are short, um, but very concentrated um, to the point. It's interesting. Um, and once again, thanks for this interview. Great to have you. Thank you. Thanks very much.